Hi everyone, today we'll be talking about the history of dentistry and this is chapter one in the Modern Dental Assisting textbook, the 13th edition by authors Bird and Robinson. So dentistry has been around for quite a number of years, um, longer than what we normally think that dentistry is, has been around for. Uh, we, you know, art, uh, scientists have found artifacts of wooden toothbrushes with hair bristles, along with teeth containing gold and jewels. And uh, that's, that was, in those days, that was the idea of cosmetic dentistry. And it's been excavated from sites from as early as BC or before Christ. Here you see a picture of figure 1-1, and these figures have directly been taken from your textbook of the Bird and Robinson textbook. And if you see here, you could see a gold banded bridge, which is quite similar to the bridge that we have nowadays um, in our mouths that you'll see when you go out into the practices when you start doing your externships. Of course, this is from a cadaver or the remains uh, you know, of a cadaver, whichever, but it, you'll see that it's quite, it's quite similar how all of this is all banded together. If we talk about the Egyptians, as long as 4,600 years ago in Egypt, physicians began to specialize in healing certain parts of the body. Uh, a physician named Hesse Ray was the earliest dentist whose name is known. So, I mean, that's as far as we, as we know, and that goes as back as 3000 BC. And uh, Hesse Ray was known to be the chief of the toothers and the physicians back then. And just a little fun fact, a radiograph of the skull of Thuyo, which is the mother-in-law of Pharaoh, uh, uh, Amen Hotep III showed bone loss in her jaws, which is an indication of periodontal disease. So, I mean, obviously it existed back then, but you know, it just brings it more into reality when we see the skull itself. The Greeks, like during the fifth century before Christ, well, the practice of medicine and dentistry was based on the worship practices of the priesthood. So we're also going back into, you know, into the days of the Greeks when, when this was practiced as well, and we were exposed to it. Hippocrates, back uh, 460 and 377 before Christ, was considered the father of medicine. And basically, he described the teeth, their formation, and their eruptions, as well as diseases of the teeth and methods of treatment. And, you know, this goes into what you will all be also swearing by, the Hippocratic Oath. So many doctors, physicians, assistants, everybody, we go through the Hippocratic Oath. And that's basically, um, I guess, uh, more of a, so like a, a sworn in statement after we graduate. It's a solemn obligation to refrain from any wrongdoing and to treat patients with confidentiality and to the best of one's ability. And you still serve as a basis of the code of ethics for medical and to dental professionals today. It's still, it's still active today. And it goes back as far as, you know, Hippocrates. Aristotle, you might have heard of a little bit, um, but not in the traditional sense. I mean, we are, we are referring, we're basically referring to Aristotle to, you know, because he referred to teeth in many of his writings. The Chinese around the second century AD developed a, developed a silver amalgam paste for fillings more than a thousand years before dentists in the West used a similar substance. And the Romans, the Romans basically they thought of they thought of when when they had toothaches it came from something called a toothworm. So again, they think of they're thinking of pathology or something negative that's affecting the teeth. And you know, it, although it wasn't really a toothworm, but it's nice to know, or it's very interesting to know that back then that you know they knew that there was something pathologically going wrong. Um, and there's also a high regard for oral hygiene as well back then. You, you may, uh, you, you know, you might remember, or definitely your book mentions it, Cornelius, Cornelius Celsus. Well, he wrote a medical digest, okay, and then you have Claudius Gallen. He's known as the greatest physician after Hippocrates, and that's list, and he basically listed teeth as bones of the body. So now we're talking about how teeth are connected to the rest of our body, uh, rather than it being a separate issue from you know, our hands, our heart, our stomach, etc. Talking about the Renaissance, well, there was, there started to become a separation of science from theology and superstition. Because as you go more further back in time, there was more of it being together, the science, the superstition, and the actual, like uh, the, the, the study of theology. 
but now there's starting to be a more of a separation of the Renaissance. Artists became more aware of human anatomy and they used it to enhance their artwork. Uh, Ambrose Parry uh, is considered the, fa the father of modern surgery. You might have heard of Pierre Fauchard and he uh, basically is known as the father of modern dentistry. We have a lovely picture up here on the side of him, uh, on the side of the slide rather. And basically esta he established dentistry as an independent profession and originated the title dental surgeon, which we still use today on graduates of dental schools. For example, the doctor of dental surgery, the DDS license that's granted towards uh, those dentists that you know, graduate dental school, they, they, they could receive a DDS degree. So you know, where there's thinking of making it as an independent uh, entity when Fauchard was around. If you look at this slide here, um, again, about Fauchard, he falsified the theory that tooth decay, tooth decay was caused by a toothworm. And it, you know, he was ahead of his time in, in, understanding, um, in understanding periodontal disease and recognized that scaling the teeth could prevent gum disease. He firmly believed that to ensure good health, people should rinse their mouth every morning you know, with several spoonfuls of their own fresh urine. So although you know, maybe fresh urine isn't really our choice, but back then, it just goes to show that, you know, even the fact of rinsing, the fact of rinsing, even that was starting to become up and coming, you know, and, 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 it, and it pertains to good health and, and good dental health. Again, Falchard is considered the father of modern dentistry. Paul Revere, you might have heard of in English class, maybe. Well, he was, or, or rather the uh, history class. But Paul Revere is famous, uh, or he's a famous colonial patriot. He began the science of forensic dentistry, and he performed, first, he performed the first identification of corpse, of his corpse, of a corpse recorded in dental history. So that's a big deal. I mean, we're talking about, you know, you, you have a cadaver, and now he can actually identify, you know, a, a body just from, uh, just from the dental case. He was able to identify corpses that were killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill back in 1775, because a lot of them were incinerated. So, you know, he, he worked with what he had and it, it was pretty amazing how fast and how, how far dentistry had come even back in 1775. Horace Hayden from 1769 to 1844, the book talks a little bit about him. He lectures to medical students about dentistry and he also wrote some journals. Hayden and his student Chopin Harris established the first dental college in the world in 1840. That's even a bigger deal. You might have heard of it. Um, its former name was Baltimore College of Dental Surgery, but now it's called University of Maryland School of Dentistry. Okay. The early pioneers, uh, one of the early pioneers named uh, Dr. Green Bartman Black or G.V. Black, uh, he's more famous for being known as G.V. Black. He's the grand old man of dentistry, and he's thought that dentistry should stand as a profession independent from and equal to that of medicine. Okay, so he did two major contributions overall. He believed in extension for prevention, and he believed in standardized rules of cavity preparation and fillings. Uh, extension for prevention was a concept that you go ahead and do a filling in different parts of the tooth because those parts of the tooth were going to get a cavity anyway. So his thought process was that you might as well just drill it and fill it. Unfortunately now, or fortunately rather, we are more conservative in our preparation of teeth and we no longer follow the extension for prevention rule. Dentists don't follow that. But for many, many, many years, extension for prevention was uh, a, big, um, a big factor uh, that many dentists were following. Standardized rules of cavity preparation and filling, I mean, that's still a big one today. There was, um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Yes, there is the class one, class two, class three, class four and five preparations. There, there are ways of, of designing how to drill a tooth for it to get a filling. And he came up with those standard, standardized rules. Wilhelm Conrad Bronchin, um, your book talks a, a, a little bit about him. And you'll see a little picture on the side right here. Again, all these pictures are directly from your textbook. Willem Conrad Bronchin, uh, he was a Bavarian physicist who discovered X-rays in 1895. So he actually discovered X-rays. Horace Wells is another very, very important person. He discovered inhalation anesthesia in 1844. 
Before that, now the reason why this is so big is because before that, people just simply used adult alcohol and brutal force to get the tooth out or to get some sort of, I don't know, uh, alleviation of pain. So they would get them really drunk and they would just either rip a tooth out and sometimes even violence to get rid of an entity that was causing an issue in the mouth. Women, we can't forget, obviously, there were many women in dental history that also contributed to very important, to very much important factors. Some women broke barriers and led the way for other women to follow as dental professionals. For example, you have N Nellie Poole Chapman, Lucy Hobbs Taylor, Dr. Faith Sei So Leung, and Dr. Deborah Greenspan. And Dr. Green, Dr. Greenspan was pretty big on the dental issues related to HIV. So that's more recent, but there are huge dental issues related to HIV. Your book mentions something about hairy leukoplakia. Hairy, hairy leukoplakia was a pathology found in the mouth that was very much pertaining to patients that had HIV. Another fun fact for you to know on the side is today nearly 50% or half of the students in some dental schools are female, okay? And the number is growing, okay? African Americans were also, uh, you know, they also played a huge, huge part in dental history. African Americans were not accepted for training at any dental schools back in 1867. There was a uh, individual, her picture is right here, Ida Gray Rollins. She's the first African-American woman in the USA to earn her formal DDS degree and the first African woman, African-American woman to practice dentistry in Chicago. American Indians also played, a play and played a huge part in dental history. A very current person, Dr. George Blue Spruce Jr. is the first American Indian dentist in the USA. He graduated from dental school in 1956, and he's currently an assistant dean for the American Indian Affairs in Arizona, okay? <laughs> and there's his picture right there on the side. There's also Jessica Rickard. Jessica Rickard was the first recognized American Indian female dentist in 1975. The history of dental assisting, we see a little picture of him. C. Edmund Kells. Uh, New Orleans dentist. Um, he was a New Orleans dentist. He employed women as dental assistants in his office, and it made it more respectable for women patients to visit a dental office unaccompanied. So a lot of women back then did not feel embarrassed if they were not accompanied from their husband or their father to come seek dental treatment. Instead, when we had women there in the practice, it made a lot of female patients more comfortable. In 1948, certifying board, the Certifying Board of the American Dental Assistance Association was established, which is now considered <clears throat> to be known as the DANBY. And the DANBY is the Dental Assisting National Board. Hazel and Therese, Hazel, Therese, and Ann Ehrlich, I'm sorry, uh, they set the sand, standards for the dental assisting textbooks in 1976, and they co-authored the Modern Dental Assisting. Okay, dental accreditation. By 1900, educational requirements were increasing dramatically. Of course, once you have a career, you have a lot more people that are wanting to be a part of it. And as they become a part of it, now a lot of places require a lot of restrictions because we need to have a lot of rules set in place so everyone can follow the proper standard of care. The Commission on Dental Accreditation of the American Dental Association uh, has several functions, and one of them is to evaluate and accredit dental educational programs in the USA. Programs are evaluated every seven years through site team visits and comprehensive self-studies. And it assures that programs continue to meet the high standards set forth by dental professionals. Thank you.